Water usually doesn't float above water. Unless, well, you're in Germany. In Magdeburg, a 918 meter long steel aqueduct carries an entire canal over the Elbe River, allowing massive ships to sail 34 meters above the current below. The bridge weighs 24,900 tons and holds 4,300 cubic meters of water and stretches wide enough for a two-way vessel traffic. But building it meant solving impossible problems, sinking riverbeds, 13,000 ton support loads, steel expansion over a meter, and the threat of collapse from even one miscalculated weld. So how do you suspend a canal over a river without breaking it in half? Well, you see, Germany had a problem, and a big one. For years, cargo ships trying to travel between Western and Eastern Germany were constantly getting stuck at the Elbe River. The issue wasn't just traffic, it was the river itself. The Elbe's water levels shifted wildly. Some days, ships couldn't pass at all, and other days, they were forced to wait for hours or reroute entirely. And when that happens, the costs rack up fast. Each day of delay, around 1 million lost in shipping time, fuel and logistics. So Germany made a really, really difficult decision to stop depending on the Elbe and build over it. Literally, a bridge, but not for cars, for water. It's called the Magdeburg Canal Bridge, stretching 918 meters. It's the longest navigable aqueduct in Europe, designed to carry the Mittelland Canal over the Elbe River and connect it with the Elbe Havel Canal. Now ships can pass straight across, with no waiting, no detours, and no river drama. But this fix wasn't something Germany thought up overnight. They'd been sitting on this plan for nearly a century. Back in the 1920s, engineers wanted this connection. In 1934, they even started building it. But you know, the Second World War stopped everything cold. And for decades, those concrete pillars stood abandoned, cut off by history, until reunification changed everything. Once East and West Germany rejoined, the need to finish this link became really urgent. So in 1993, construction came back with full force as a part of the German Unity Transport Project number 17. Over 130 million went into the bridge alone, but the entire waterway junction, that topped 500 million. A big spend, sure, but the payoff was huge. Now ships sail smoothly through one of the busiest island shipping corridors in Europe. But how do you even build a bridge that carries an entire canal over a river? Well, let's break it down. Well, you're starting with the scale. The bridge stretches 918 meters long and spans 43 meters wide, big enough to allow two-way traffic for massive ships. The central span alone covers 106.2 meters, and that part has to support thousands of tons of water, plus fully loaded vessels gliding through every day. We're talking about an artificial waterway suspended above a living river. Needless to say, the weight adds up quickly. The steel superstructure alone weighs 24,900 tons. And just so everybody knows, for perspective, that's about the weight of four Eiffel Towers. And then you add the volume of water, 4,300 cubic meters and full-size cargo ships, every part of this bridge had to be built like it was carrying a moving mountain because it was. So to manage that, the engineers broke the bridge into two main parts, the foreshore bridge and the main bridge. The foreshore bridge acts like a gradual on-ramp, so to speak. It runs 690 meters, guiding the canal smoothly toward the Elbe. And then comes the main bridge, 227.4 meters long built to span the river directly. Now the biggest span was 106.2 meters of open air beneath the canal. And all of this sits inside a 34 meter wide steel trough, deep enough to carry water and keep ships floating safely, no matter the load. Now let's talk about what holds it all up, because needless to say, you can't support that kind of weight with guesswork. The foreshore bridge rests on 17 supported columns, each built with 51 centimeter thick reinforced concrete piles. These piles were driven 12 meters into the ground, anchoring into dense sediment layers to avoid any sinking or shifting. But the real challenge was the riverbed itself. For the central columns standing directly in the Elbe, engineers had to find a way to support over 13,000 tons per column without using deep foundation piles. And they used what was called flat founded columns, meaning each one sits directly on the riverbed. 
no anchors, no piles, just precision pressure distribution. But then, like, how do you keep them from moving? Well, you split the construction into eight distinct phases, balancing the weight as you go. That way, no single point carries too much load at once. Every concrete pour, every steel placement, every pressure adjustment was calculated to keep the structure steady through all the stages of the build. And then comes the steel. You can't just use any metal here. The bridge needed S355 steel, which is a high strength material, tough enough to handle the constant strain of moving ships fluctuating water loads and environmental stress. And the main load-bearing beams, called box girders, are 8.15 meters tall and 4 meters wide, shaped like huge rectangular tubes. And inside, they're packed with horizontal braces, vertical ribs, and diagonal cross ties, forming a rigid network that spreads the load evenly. And all of it had to account for extreme events, like windstorms or even accidental collisions. Because, like, what happens if a cargo ship hits a bridge support head-on? Well, first off, oh frick, and thankfully the engineers modeled that exact scenario. They calculated the impact force at 23 million newtons, which means, translation, that's the same force as 1,500 full-speed trucks smashing into the column. Now, to absorb that kind of blow, they reinforced the base of each column with extra steel plating and wrapped energy-absorbing buffers around them to take the hit without damaging the entire structure. But the real trick, believe it or not, was flexibility. This massive steel structure expands and contracts every single day. On hot summer days, the entire structure can expand nearly one meter. In winter, it shrinks again. That constant shift would tear most bridges apart. So the Mandeberg Bridge includes four expansion joints, each 94 centimeters wide, built into the trough. These joints stretch and contract with the steel, preventing cracks and keeping the water channel sealed tight. And speaking of sealed, when you're holding a canal, I cannot get over the fact that is happening, full of water in a steel box above a river, leaks are the last thing that you want. The entire bottom of the canal trough is coated in a corrosion-resistant waterproofing membrane, and it's built to last decades without rust, even with the constant exposure to water and weather. No gaps, no shortcuts, just watertight engineering from start to finish. Now, construction. A bridge like this does not get built all at once. The entire structure had to be assembled in prefabricated segments, many of them weighing over 150 tons. They were built off-site to exact measurements and then transported to the construction area. Of course, the biggest challenge came when they had to launch the main span across the river. That part was 13,500 tons of steel. And they couldn't just crane it into place, though I'm sure they would have loved to. Instead, what they used were hydraulic jacks to push the entire span forward at a steady rate of 7 meters per hour. And yes, that is slower than you walk. But when you're moving a structure this big, speed is not your friend. Precision is. The bridge rolled out over a floating pontoon positioned in the river. Once it reached the other side, 12 synchronized hydraulic presses, each capable of lifting 1,000 tons, carefully lowered the bridge onto its final supports, very slowly, because one misalignment and the entire operation could tilt. Every millimeter counted. Meanwhile, the foreshore bridge was going up too, and that part used 17 prefabricated steel sections, each 42 meters long. A crawler crane hoisted them into place one by one. And then came the welding. But you see, welding here isn't just about fusing steel, it's about doing so without twisting metal out of shape. So workers followed a strict sequence, welding from the inside out, maintaining perfect alignment with each pass. By October 2001, all steel was in place. By January 2002, the last welds were done. And then now came the moment everyone was waiting for, filling the canal. But this wasn't just a giant bucket dump, because if they filled it too fast, pressure would build unevenly and damage the entire structure. So engineers used a controlled spillway system with four pipes, each moving 44 cubic meters of water per second. And that flow was carefully monitored to ensure even distribution. And alongside this, a ventilation system kept air circulating to stop ice from forming in winter. 
keeping the water flowing even in freezing conditions. Once the water level was stabilized, the last job was connecting it to the Hollenworth double lock, located east of the bridge. Now, these locks were custom built to handle enormous ships, 185 meters long, 12 and a half meters wide, and 18 and a half meters deep. The gates were made of solid steel, each one weighing over 1,000 tons, opening and closing with hydraulic precision. Together, the bridge and locks formed a seamless highway for water traffic across Germany. And finally, after six long years of non-stop construction, the bridge was ready. But before anything could open, it needed a test. A full-size cargo ship loaded with 1,350 tons of goods, making it the first official crossing. No margin for error. The canal had to handle the weight, the current, the motion, and it did. Smooth sailing from one end to the other, no cracks, no shifts, no surprises, just a perfect pass over 34 meters of open space with a river flowing quietly below. That moment locked it in. On October 10th, 2003, the Madeburg Canal Bridge officially opened after nearly a century of planning. Setbacks and delayed dreams, Germany now had a direct, unbroken water route connecting east and west. Now this sounds so amazing, but not everyone was on board because behind all the celebration there were critics, and their concerns ran deep. Just one day before the grand opening, a nearby lock system failed, water blasting through, eroding a street and part of the canal bank. Crews moved fast to repair the damage, and the bridge still opened on schedule, but questions remained. The 500 million investment promised big cargo traffic, up to 7 million tons a year. By 2015, that number hovered below 6. Critics called it oversized. Environmental groups warned it could harm regional water systems, but still, Meidelberg's port is growing, and the bridge, it's here to stay. Don't forget to like, drop a comment down below, and turn on notifications for more megastructure deep dives.